Thank you for listening to Depictions Media Radio. Welcome to Policy and Rights, the show about government policy and human rights. Welcome back to Policy and Rights here on Depictions Media Radio. I'm your host, Michael Cloggs. Okay, this is quite simple. And I want to get straight to the point on, on this. That we have to impress upon our elected officials, our leadership around the world, to work together. We need to do something that is going to bring war to an end on in our society we got to find ways to to work together we got to find ways to accept each other's ideas so that we can live happy abundant and plentiful lives we got to start stop thinking that well he's different than I am or she's different than I am or hey they they think differently than I do because their pronouns aren't the same as mine it get, really gets to be that simple that we need to find a way to work together we've we've he- heard about what is going on in the Ukraine We've heard about different things that happen around the world that impoverish people, suppress people, and it, we we as just the general people in the population of our planet need to step up and say no more. We are hearing that um, Vladimir Putin and Joe Biden, they're on combating ends of things. One is saying that he wants to end the uh, treaties and agreements on nuclear weapons with NATO and the United States and the Western world. We have one saying that Vladimir Putin is, is simply just a bully and he needs to be stopped. This is going to keep cycling and circling. And while all of uh, all of these these leaders of, of countries are battling it out, it is our lives that are being placed in jeopardy, and we need to speak up and say no more. Let's get our leadership to a table so that they can talk through their problems and we can put the guns down. Okay, with that being said, we're going to hear from a speech from President Joe Biden as he is going to be talking about... uh, He's speaking from Poland and he is talking about the one year mark of the invasion of of Ukraine and vowed that Americans would continue to counter the Russian aggression and what we're going to see is more arms put up and the um, and after one year of fighting it doesn't look like there's going to be an immediate end to the aggression so let's listen to President Biden as he delivers his speech in Poland. Hello, Poland! One of our 
our great allies, President Duda, Prime Minister, Mr. Prime Minister, Mr. Mayor, to all the former ministers and presidents, as well as mayors and Polish political leaders from all across the country, thank you for welcoming back to Poland. You know, it was nearly one year ago, nearly one year ago I spoke at the Royal Castle here in Warsaw, just weeks after Vladimir Putin had unleashed his murderous assault on Ukraine, the largest land war in Europe since World War II had begun, and the principles that have been the cornerstone of peace, prosperity, and stability on this planet for more than 75 years were at risk of being shattered. One year ago, the world was bracing for the fall of Kyiv. Well, I just come from a visit to Kyiv, and I can report Kyiv stands strong. <laughs> Kyiv stands proud. It stands tall. And most important, it stands free. When Russia invaded, it wasn't just Ukraine being tested. The whole world faced a test for the ages. Europe was being tested. America was being tested. NATO was being tested. All democracies are being tested. And the questions we face were as simple as they were profound. Would we respond or would we look the other way? Would we be strong or would we be weak? Would, be, we, would, we, would we, the all of our allies, would be united or divided? One year later, we know the answer. We did respond. We would be strong. We would be united. And the world would not look the other way. <clears throat> we also face fundamental questions about the commitment to the most basic of principles. Would we stand up for the sovereignty of nations? Would we stand up for the right of people to live free from naked aggression? Would we stand up for democracy? One year later, we know the answers. Yes, we would stand up for sovereignty, and we did. Yes, we would stand up for the right of people to live free from aggression, and we did. And we would stand up for democracy, and we did. And yesterday, I had the honor to stand with President Zelensky in Kyiv to declare that we will keep standing up for these same things, no matter what. <clears throat> when President Putin ordered his tanks to roll into Ukraine, he thought we would roll over. He was wrong. The Ukrainian people are too brave. America, Europe, a coalition of nations from the Atlantic to the Pacific, we were too unified. Democracy was too strong. Instead of an easy victory, he perceived and predicted. Putin left with burnout tanks and Russia's forces in, delay, in, dis in disarray. He thought he'd get the Findalization of NATO. Instead, he got the NATOization of Finland and Sweden. He thought NATO would fracture and divide. Instead, NATO was more united and more unified than ever, than ever before. He thought he could weaponize energy to crack your resolve, Europe's resolve. Instead, we're working together to end Europe's dependence on Russian fossil fuels. He thought autocrats like himself were tough and leaders of democracy were soft. And then he met the iron will of America and the nations everywhere that refused to accept the world governed by fear and force. He found himself at war with a nation led by a man whose courage would be forged in fire and steel, President Zelensky. President Putin, President Putin is confronted with something today that he didn't think was possible a year ago. The democracies of the world have grown stronger, not weaker. But the autocrats of the world have grown weaker, not stronger. Because in the moments of great upheaval and uncertainty, that knowing what you stand for is most important. And knowing who stands with you makes all the difference. The people of Poland know that, you know that. In fact, you know, you know it better than anyone here in Poland. Because that's what solidarity means. Through 
partition and oppression when the beautiful city was destroyed after the Warsaw Uprising during decades under the iron fist of communist rule Poland endured because you stood together. That's how brave leaders of the opposition and the people of Belarus continue to fight for their democracy. That's how the resolve of Moldovan people The resolve of the people of Moldova to live in freedom when it gained them independence and put them on the path to EU membership. President Sandu is here today. I'm not sure where she is, but I'm proud to stand with you and the freedom-loving people of Moldova. Give her a round of applause. One year, in, one year into this war, Putin no longer doubts the strength of our coalition. But he still doubts our conviction. He doubts our staying power. He doubts our continued support for Ukraine. He doubts whether NATO can remain unified. But there should be no doubt. Our support for Ukraine will not waver. NATO will not be divided, and we will not tire. <laughs> President Putin's craven lust for land and power will fail and the Ukrainian people's love for their country will prevail. Democracy will stand guard over freedom today, tomorrow, and forever. So that's, what it's, that's what's at stake here, freedom. That's the message I carried to Kyiv yesterday, directly to the people of Ukraine. When President Zelensky said he came to the United States in December, quote, he said, this struggle will define the world and what our children and grandchildren, how they live, and then their children and grandchildren. He wasn't only speaking about the children and grandchildren of Ukraine. He was speaking about all of our children and grandchildren, yours and mine. We're seeing again today what the people of Poland and the people across Europe saw for decades. Appetites of the autocrat cannot be appeased they must be opposed. Autocrats only understand one word, no, no, no. No, you will not take my country. No, you will not take my freedom. No, you will not take my future. And I'll repeat tonight what I said last year in the same place. A dictator bent on rebuilding an empire will never be able to ease the people's love of liberty. Brutality will never grind down the will of the free. And Ukraine, Ukraine will never be a victory for Russia. Never. For free people refuse to live in a world of hopelessness and darkness. You know, this has been an extraordinary year in every sense. Extraordinary brutality from Russian forces and mercenaries. They've committed depravities, crimes against humanity, without shame or compunction. They've targeted civilians with death and destruction, used rape as a weapon of war, stolen Ukrainian children in an attempt to, in an attempt to steal Ukraine's future, bombed train stations, maternity hospitals, schools, and orphanages. No one. No one can turn away their eyes from the atrocities Russia is committing against the Ukrainian people. It's abhorrent. It's abhorrent. But extraordinarily, as well, has been the response of the Ukrainian people and the world. One year after the bombs began to fall, Russian tanks rolled into Ukraine. Ukraine is still independent and free. From Kyrgyzstan to Kharkiv, Ukrainian fighters have reclaimed their land. More than 50 percent of the territory Russia held last year. The blue and the yellow flag of Ukraine proudly waves once again. President Zelensky still leads a democratically elected government that represents the will of the Ukrainian people. And the world has already voted multiple times, including the United Nations General Assembly, to condemn Russians' aggression 
and support a just peace. Each time in the UN, that vote has been overwhelming. In October, 143 nations of the United Nations condemned Russia's illegal annexation. Only four, four in the entire UN voted with Russia. Four. So tonight, I speak once more to the people of Russia. The United States and the nations of Europe do not seek to control or destroy Russia. The West was not plotting to attack Russia, as Putin said today. And millions of Russian citizens who only want to live in peace with their neighbors are not the enemy. This war is never a necessity. It's a tragedy. President Putin chose this war. Every day the war continues is his choice. He could end the war with a word. It's simple. If Russia stopped invading Ukraine, it would end the war. If Ukraine stopped defending itself against Russia, it would be the end of Ukraine. That's why together we're making sure Ukraine can defend itself. The United States has assembled a world, worldwide coalition of more than 50 nations to get critical weapons and supplies to the brave Ukrainian fighters on the front lines, air defense systems, artillery, ammunition, tanks, armored vehicles. The European Union and its member states have stepped up with unprecedented commitment to Ukraine, not just in security assistance, but economic and humanitarian refugee assistance and so much more. To all of you here tonight, take a moment, and I'm serious when I say this, Turn around, and look, turn around and look at one another. Look at what you've done so far. Poland is hosting more than 1.5 million refugees from this war. God bless you. <laughs> Poland's generosity, your willingness to open your hearts and your homes is extraordinary. And the American people are united in our resolve as well. All across my country, in big cities and small towns, Ukrainian flags fly from American homes. Over the past year, Democrats and Republicans in our United States Congress have come together to stand for freedom. That's who Americans are, and that's what Americans do. The world is also coming together to address the global fallout from President Putin's war. Putin tried to starve the world blocking the ports in the Black Sea to stop Ukraine from exporting its grain, exacerbating the global food crisis that hit developing nations in Africa especially hard. Instead, the United States and the G7 and partners around the world answered the call with historic commitments to address the crisis and to bolster global food supplies. And this week, my wife, Jill Biden, is traveling to Africa to help bring attention to this critical issue. Our commitment is to the people of Ukraine and the future of Ukraine, a Ukraine that's free, sovereign, and democratic. That was the dream of those who declared Ukraine's independence more than 30 years ago, who led the Orange Revolution and the Revolution of Dignity, who braved ice and fire in the Badan and the heavenly hundred who died there, and those who continue still to root out Kremlin's efforts to corrupt, coerce, and control. It's a dream for those Ukrainian patriots who fought for years against Russia's aggressions in the Donbass, and the heroes who've given everything, given their lives in the service of their beloved Ukraine. I was honored to visit their memorial in Kyiv yesterday to pay tribute to the sacrifice of those who lost their lives, standing alongside President Zelensky. The United States and our partners stand with Ukraine's teachers, its hospital staff, its emergency responders, the workers in cities across Ukraine who are fighting to keep the power on in the face of Russia's cruel bombardment. We stand with the millions of refugees of this war who found a welcome in Europe and the United States, particularly here in Poland. Ordinary people all across Europe did whatever they could to help and continue to do so. 
Polish businesses, civil society, cultural leaders, including the First Lady of Poland, who is here tonight, have led with the heart and determination, showcasing all that's good about the human spirit. Madam First Lady, we love you. Thank you all. I'll never forget last year visiting with refugees from Ukraine who had just arrived in Warsaw, seeing their faces, exhausted and afraid, holding their children so close, worrying they might never see their fathers, their husbands, their brothers, their sisters again. In that darkest moment of their lives, you, the people of Poland, offered them safety and light. You embraced them. You literally embraced them. I watched. I watched the looks on their faces. Meanwhile, together we made sure the Russia is paying the price for its abuses. We continue to maintain the largest sanction regime ever imposed in any country in history. And we're going to announce more sanctions this week together with our partners. We'll hold accountable those who are responsible for this war. And we'll seek justice for the war crimes and crimes against humanity continuing to be committed by the Russians. You know, there is much for us to be proud of over the all that we have achieved together this past year. But we have to be honest and clear-eyed as we look at the year ahead. The defense of freedom is not the work of a day or of a year. It's always difficult. It's always important. As Ukraine continues to defend itself against the Russian onslaught and launch counteroffensive of its own, there will continue to be hard and very bitter days, victories and tragedies. But Ukraine is steel for the fight ahead. And the United States, together with our allies and partners, are going to continue to have Ukraine's back as it defends itself. Next year, I will host every member of NATO for our 2024 summit in the United States. Together, we'll celebrate the 75th anniversary of the strongest defensive alliance in the history of the world, NATO. And, and let there be no doubt, the commitment of the United States to our NATO alliance and Article 5 is rock solid. And every member of NATO knows it. And Russia knows it as well. An attack against one is attack against all. It's a sacred oath. Sacred oath to defend every inch of NATO territory. Over the past year, the United States has come together with our allies and partners in an extraordinary coalition to stand against Russian aggression. But the work in front of us is not just what we're against. It's about what we're for. What kind of world do we want to build? We need to take the strength and capacity of this coalition and apply it to lifting up, lifting up the lives of people everywhere, improving health, growing prosperity, preserving the planet, building peace and security, treating everyone with dignity and respect. That's our responsibility. The democracies of the world have to deliver it for our people. As we gather tonight, the world, in my view, is at an, at an inflection point. The decisions we make over the next five years or so are going to determine and shape our lives for decades to come. That's true for Americans. That's true for the people of the world. And while decisions are ours to make now, the principles and the stakes are eternal. The choice between chaos and stability between building and destroying, between hope and fear, between democracy that lifts up the human spirit and the brutal hand of the dictator who crushes it, between nothing less than limitation and possibilities, the kind of possibilities that come when people who live not in captivity but in freedom, 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 there is no sweeter word than freedom there is no nobler goal than freedom. There's no higher aspiration than freedom. Americans know that, and you know it. And all that we do now must be done so our children and grandchildren will know it as well. Freedom. The enemy of the tyrant and the hope of the brave and the truth of the ages. Freedom. 
Stand with us. We will stand with you. Let us move forward with faith and conviction and with an abiding commitment to be allies, not of darkness, but of light, not of oppression, but of liberation, not of captivity, but yes, of freedom. May God bless you all. May God protect our troops. And may God bless the heroes of Ukraine and all those who defend freedom around the world. Thank you, Poland. Thank you, thank you, thank you for what you're doing. God bless you all. So that was uh, Joe Biden as he spoke um, in Warsaw, Poland. In inspiring speech, um, you know, trying to get people to realize their freedom. But we do need to realize our freedom. We also need to realize that we don't necessarily need to go to war. That there is, that war is a step back towards conversation and negotiation. That we need to, to inspire our leaders to use conversation to end global conflicts. That we need to use negotiation to get what we need as a species and to help others live better. We <coughs> at some point need to need to learn to throw away the idea of war as a first or second measure. It's got to be well, if we're using the letters of the alphabet from A to Z it has got to be dead last Z. We that everything else has been exhausted before we take up arms against each other. I want to thank you for listening to Policy and Rights today. I've been your host, Michael Cloggs, and I ask you at this time to find that subscribe button wherever it may be so that you can get continued updates from us and from Depictions Media. This show has been produced by Depictions Media. Please contact us at depictions.media for more information.